Christianity is not a single player sport. It's a team sport. And like any team sport, it takes individual effort for the work to get done, for the game to, be, to actually be played, for it to be a, a winning team. But in and of itself, it is not an individual sport. It is a, a team sport. So, so if Colton Wong, right, decided to, to, to go out, right, second baseman, let me make sure, right, just decided to go out, you know, and, uh, and just not really put forth his effort in the game. That he really just pretty much just sat there, or maybe just stood there, because sitting would be a little bit too obvious, right? But he just stood there, and any time the ball was hit to him, he just kind of let it go by. And in the locker room, when they were talking about and, and planning for the next, next game or what have you, and, and getting ready for it and everything, he really didn't participate. He kind of just put on his headphones, did his own thing, right? And, and just kind of went into his own little hole in the wall kind of thing, and just stood, stayed there until it was game time. And then, when it came to practice, he really didn't show up on time, he really didn't do much, he didn't really participate much, he just kind of was there, but nothing else. If that was how Colton Wong did it, one person that was that way, if that's how he just played the game, what would happen to the team? Well, first off, the coach would check him out, right? But if the coach didn't, what would happen to the team? They would really begin to lose big time, right? Because, because one player can make a difference in the entire team. If Matt Ryan, the quarterback of, of Atlanta, of the, of the Falcons, that's, that's football. Okay. Matt Ryan, the quarterback of the Atlanta Falcons, went out and played his hardest every day. Like, like, like he practiced everything that he could. He was, he was doing throws, he was doing the run backs, he was doing everything, right? He was practicing as much as he could. But then he had his, his white receivers, those are the ones that catch the ball out there, right? So if his white receivers, though, they just kind of sloughed off and they really didn't do much, right? It didn't matter how much Matt Ryan really practiced and how well he was, right? He's like the, the fifth top paid athlete in the entire world. That is ridiculous. Atlanta, I love Atlanta, but they're not that good. He's the, I think he is the second, maybe the top, NFL quarterback being paid. Makes more money than anybody else in the NFL. Not him, maybe he's second. Anyway, he does everything that he does. And he is a fantastic top line player. But his white receivers do absolutely nothing. They just kind of sit in the video room watching YouTube all day and, you know, eating stuff that isn't good for them. Atlanta will play pretty much like they did the second half of the Super Bowl. Right? Just keep up. Wouldn't do any good. So there's individual effort within a team sport, but it takes a team in order to really win at the sport. Really is, is something that, that everybody has to, to work together. That, that's what Christianity really does. It's, it's a place not for individuals, right? It's not just simply that Christ died only for the individual, but he died for his church, right? That's what the Bible continuously says. We saw that a couple of weeks ago in Sunday school. He died for his church. It's a team, not just, not just the individual, but it is the local church. It is the church as a whole. It is not just an individual sport. And so we have the writer of Hebrews who tells us not right, to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. That's not it, right? Those who are, who are seek, uh, seeking to separate themselves, they're in the wrong. Those who seek to assemble themselves, that's what church actually means, assembly. Those who assemble themselves, those are the people that we're supposed to be. Not like the others. We assemble ourselves together as, the habit, as, as is not the habit of others, but is to be our habit so that we can encourage one another. We have to stir each other up in love and good works. Thus, as individuals, we are stirring up the team, and we are encouraging each other, and we are being encouraged by others. Now, if we open up the text, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Verses 24 to 27, it's often easily misunderstood as to what Paul is referring to. Paul is speaking of this individual sport mentality. We shouldn't be having that, but we should really have this mentality of using a team. So 
was using sports metaphors to help us understand what the church is about. And that the individual members of the church ought to really be focusing on is not themselves, but upon the team. Thus, we are looking at this as a team, as we read this, right? And we are looking at it as a team's determination. These are the three points that we're good about this. Determination, okay? Direction, and finally, discipline. This is what we're looking at. So, if you will, please stand for the honor of the reading of God's Word. Starting at verse 24, we're going to go all the way to verse 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. And the Lord bless the reading of his word. And may be seated. So the first uh, objective that Paul is pointing to in these four verses is that the church, and therefore the members of the church, right? We as individuals, being members of this team, of the church, we must have determination. We must be determined to do what? Well, if you're a team, what are you determined to do? Win. There you go. We're supposed to win, right? That's our determination. We are determined to win. A few weeks ago, we talked about how Corinth was, was uh, right in the middle of, of three great cities, right? You had, you had Athens up here. And then you had Sparta, uh, Sparta down here, and I was like, Sparta, that's, that's not right, Sparta, down here. Olympia was over here, Corinth was right here in the middle. And we were talking about how each of these kind of basically had their own type of, of people there. So you had your smart people, your, your, your philosophers and such, and Athens and such, and so you had your, your, your profound people, and then you had your, your people down here that were really good at war at one point in time. They were, they were known for that, the Spartans, right? We are Sparta, right? And so, so you had the powerful down here, you had the profound, you had the powerful, and over here you had Olympia, where, of course, what took place over here? The Olympics, right? And so the, the very elite athletes were the, at the Olympics, right? And so you had your, your prestigious people over here, your profound, powerful, prestigious, and then you had Corinth in the middle. Now, Corinth kind of got people from all walks of life into it. They were in the center of it all. Being in the center of it all, they came upon a way to show them. And so they actually had their own games. Much like the Olympics, a little bit different than the Olympics. The Olympics met every how many years? Do you remember? Just trying to keep you guys engaged, that's all. How many? Four years. Very good. All right. So, so very good. So the, the uh, Corinth actually made up their own games called the Isthmian Games. They were just like the Olympics, except rather than meeting every four years, they met every two years. Just outside of Corinth, they, they had these games going on. They were second only to the Olympics in attendance and in people trying to, to, uh, to compete and, and such, right? So, so they competed every two years rather than every four. And in fact, in fact, it was actually highly likely that Paul was there in Corinth when the Ithmian Games occurred. Whether or not he went to it, we don't know, but he was at least probably almost 100% likely there in, in AD 51 when these games actually occurred. And there was a stadium that was there, just outside the city, for the competitors to compete. And so in the stadium, there were races, and there were boxing, there was wrestling, there was all these other types of sports that were going on. And it was this stadium that Paul is referring to. And in the ESV, it says all the runners run, run this race. Race is not the word there. Stadium is the word. Because the race would have, of course, been in the stadium. And of course, if you're going to run in the stadium, the only reason that you would run in the stadium is because you were running in any what? Okay, so it makes kind of sense why they translate it that way. But there is this, this is the stadium that Paul is referring to. And so he asked them, do you not know that all the runners race in the stadium? They run in the stadium. And while they're all running, only one can win. Only one can win. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever run in a race. Anybody ever run in a race like 5K? Not like a child's race, like a 5K or anything like that. Anybody ever run in something like that? I have run in a race a couple of times, in a couple of five cases. 
guess what? Here's a newsflash. Not everybody that is there is there to win the race. Almost nobody is actually there to win the race. I think, if I remember correctly, the time, I think the fastest time that, uh, that, that somebody ran, ran the 5K, when, 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 uh, when I had run it, is right around six, a six minute mile. I had done in 18 minutes, 3.1 miles in 18 minutes. I myself did not run to win that race. <laughs> okay? Not everybody that was running is running to win. Now, if you go to the Olympics or you go to the Isthmian Games, you better be sure that you're running, and not just simply running just to have a good time, like other people do, but you're running to do what? What's the point in running? What's that? To win. To win. Yeah, everybody that goes into this race is determined to win the race. Now, there can only be one person that wins the race, but they're determined to actually win it. That's what the church is supposed to be determined to do, to win this race, to win the prize that is to come. And then, of course, the question is then, well, what is the prize that we are to be running to win? And this is where the mistake comes. This is where the misunderstanding of what these verses are about, because oftentimes we will take these verses apart from the context. And we will look at these verses and we go, well, of course, I'm trying to want, run to win the, the, the great, wonderful prize, eternal life, and, and such like that. That's what we're hoping to win. That's not what Paul's talking about. It's a misunderstanding of it. Because Paul actually tells us what he is talking about in the context. The athletes that were competing there uh, in, in, in the Ithmian Games, they actually ran for a crown. A perishable crown is what Paul calls them. A perishable crown. In all honesty, what their perishable crown really was, was a piece of wilted celery that was woven into the shape of a crown. Just think about that for a little bit. We're going to get back to that in just a second. That's what it was. Paul tells us, we're not running for a perishable crown. We're running for an imperishable crown, something that is going to last for forever. And like I said, some people say, well, he must be obviously talking then about eternal life. And in one sense, yeah, but not ours. Other people's. That's what we are to be determined to win. Go with me back to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. I want you to notice the language that he puts here. We're going to just read verses uh, 19 through 23. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might, what's that word there? Win more of them. To the Jew I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel, that I might share in, uh, with them in its blessings. This determination, he's calling on, on the determination of all the church, all the members of the church, the determination is to win the prize, win the imperishable wreath, and that is the souls of other people. The imperishable crown is the new converts to Christ. So to win this race, which Paul is referring, is to win the lost for Jesus. And there's a reason besides the context that I believe this. Go with me real quick, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Flip to the right just a little bit. Flip me in, uh, excuse me, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting at verse 19. Paul asks the question, for what is our hope, or joy, or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Now go to Philippians chapter 4. Look at verse 1. 
Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord. We are to be determined as a church, as individuals, be determined to win the lost for Jesus. That's what Paul is saying. But it's not only a determination that wins the race, one must also know the direction of the race. Right? To go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26, there's this, for I do not or so I do not run aimlessly. I, I do not box as one beating the air. Paul understood where he was going. I need two volunteers real quick. Two kids, practically. All right, Adam, come on up. Come on up. Alright, so wait, 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 wait. Alright, you guys ready? You guys ready? Thank you for volunteering, by the way. Can we give them a round of applause? Being so great. That was very, very much golfing. <laughs> ready? Is. 
the direction of the race, and the opponent for the boxer being two distinct objectives here, two distinct objects, but they are both needed to know. So let's talk about the direction for now. Once again, right? Paul gives direction. We can just summarize it. Look at verse 22. We can just summarize it here. Second part of verse 22. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. So to the Jews, he became like a Jew. To the proselytes, he became like a proselyte. To the pagans, he became like a pagan, though not sinning. Not following them into sin. Right? To the weak, he became as one who is weak. Now think about this for a second. Because this takes a lot of humility. Paul, uh, no, Paul, Matt. Matt was preaching on this last week. And if you haven't listened, if you haven't, if you haven't been able to hear it or whatever, I would strongly urge you to go back and listen to what Matt preached on because he was dead on. This takes a lot of humility. This isn't about rights. This isn't about, about taking up our rights. Well, I don't need to do that. I don't have to do that. No, I become all things. I will humble myself as much as I possibly have to in order to bring these people to Christ. So it takes, it takes humility, and not only just humility, it takes effort. It takes effort. Why? Verse 23. I do it for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessing. So here's the direction. Go to whatever distance that it takes, with the exception of sinning, to win the lost. I'm not going to rehash that sermon, but like I said, if you haven't listened to it, you need to. One of the things that uh, uh, Hudson Taylor was got, got in trouble for when he went and did the uh, China Inland Mission, right, was that he actually grew his hair out long like the Chinese, and people were like, hey, that's not cool. All those that were in ministry with him, hey, you can't do that. He's like, why? I become all things to all people so that by all means I might save some of them. So if that means I have to grow my hair out so that I can look like them, then I'll do that. So I can save them because, you know what, their salvation is more important than my hair length. That's, that's what we need to do. That's our direction. Become all things. Go to whatever length. Go to the extraordinary lengths if necessary, as long as it's not sin. To save the lost. I mean, think about that. What a crowd could be worn by those who are determined to run the race in the right direction. It takes more than determination, more than direction. It involves an exorbitant amount of discipline. In fact, that's pretty much the bulk of these verses. Three of the four verses really deal with discipline. So let's go back. In verse 25, sorry, verse 21. To the end. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimless, aimlessly. There's discipline, right? I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. It takes discipline. Eckerd Schnabel, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, says that athletes who competed in the games in Olympia had to swear an oath confirming that they had abstained from wine, meat, and sexual intercourse in the previous 10 months. Yeah! Right? Give me a week, give me two weeks. Right? 10 months! That's a lot. For what? A wilted piece of celery! <laughs> That's why they did it! I mean, think about that. There's a lot of other things that I might, might, might be willing to give those things up for, but a wilted piece of celery is not one. You get that for what, two days before it starts to smell and get slimy? 
they did. Think about the discipline that it took them. Paul says, I will discipline myself. Whatever way is necessary to win the loss, because the loss certainly worth more than the world's piece of celery. They are my crown, they are my joy. If we do not discipline ourselves, we may miss out on that crown. Because that's what really, you know, determination, if, if we are determined to win that crown, then it means that we must be disciplined. If we are not disciplining ourselves, that means that we are not actually determined to win the crown. So ought we not then exercise self-control? Right? And that, like I said, part of that discipline is knowing which direction we are to, to run and to race. Are we not uh, ought to, uh, to, to develop this idea of, of willingness to win the loss? As long as it means, uh, does not mean sinning. A part of it is also determining to know who is our opponent. You need to know that, right? Again, right? They, they, uh, whatever team it is, hockey, right? Blues are in a woo, right? And the, no, no blues fans here? Okay. <laughs> Never mind then, right? Blues, Cardinals, used to be the Rams that were here, you know, but Falcon, Fal Fal whatever, right? They have video rooms. They, they watch their opponents. They look at the pitchers and how they pitch and, you know, and, and the defense of their opponent. They watch it all. They know who their opponent is. It's really important to know who your opponent is because opponents fight differently. So you need to know. And Paul says, I know who my opponent is. I don't go out there and shadow box like I'm boxing nobody. I know who my opponent is. My opponent is me. We can miss that, but it's there. Because Paul says here in verse 27, but I discipline my body. The word discipline there actually means to give a black eye. It means, it means punch under eye. That's what it means. It's basically give a black eye. I give myself a black eye. And then the other one is like, I keep myself under control. Or, you know, and then that word there, it actually means I enslave myself. I drag myself around. I make myself do that which I do not want to do in order that I may win people to the Lord. I fight off the temptations that need to be tempted, right? I give myself... Paul is not advocating self-harm here. Okay? Spiritually speaking here, he is metaphorically speaking when he says that he gives himself a black eye or that he drags himself around enslaved. Because we all need to be fighting our inner selves. We're not supposed to be going out like, like some people I've heard in the past where they will flog themselves, or they will wrap a, a bar of wire around their, their thigh and they will twist it every time that they are tempted. We don't do that. Paul doesn't really mean that he gives himself literally a black eye, and I mean literally, in, not in the millennial way, where literally actually means figuratively, I mean literally in the you know, pre-millennial way, where literally actually meant literally, Right? Just making sure we all understand. He doesn't literally give himself a black eye. But spiritually speaking, he does. He will pummel his own body. I think some of the translations say that. Deny himself. Discipline himself. Just like those who are fighting the Olympians. If he has to. Thus, if he is seeking to win the Jews, and that means he cannot eat pork, and he will bring his body into subjection to it. He will enslave it and beat down those cravings because winning a lost soul is worth more than a savory piece of ham. Or as Matt said last week, if, if you become, if you must become a vegan to win a vegan, that's going to be difficult. But by golly, do it. Discipline the body. Beat it down. Beat down those cravings. Because the vegan soul is more important than whether you eat meat or drink milk ever again. That's what Paul's saying. Winning souls is more important, even, in Paul's mind, than taking a salary. 
and he will discipline his body and he will live by other means so that he can be anywhere at any time he needs to be there. So the gospel isn't hindered. I mean, how much, does, how much discipline does it take to say no to money that is rightfully yours? This is what Paul, the priest everywhere. The gospel is more important than anything. It is more important than any desire. It's more important than any right that a believer may have. Thus he is readily giving up his rights, and he is disciplining those desires, beating them down if necessary, if it means that a believer might stumble in sin. He is beating down and giving up those rights if it means that an unbeliever might be able to come to Christ. Because the gospel is too important to allow a believer to wound his conscience, which would eventually destroy him, and it is more important than eating something or doing something that we may or may not even have the right to do if it means that a soul is born. So he willingly gives up both his rights and his desires if it means that by all means he might save some of those who are lost and dying without Jesus. And he has preached this everywhere. This isn't just something to the Corinthians that he's talking about. He is preaching this everywhere. He is concerned. Right? He is making sure that he is doing this because he wants to make sure that he is not living a hypocritical life. He wants to make sure that, that, that he doesn't lose. That's what the idea of disqualified means. That's what it says in the ESV is translated disqualified. Lose the test is what or, or, or Fail the test is what it really means. So is, does he really believe that the gospel is worth everything? He says he does. But in the end, was it worth more than blank, Paul? Yes, yes it was. I discipline myself, I pummel my body, I give up my rights, I lead it around like it's been enslaved, because of this, I continuously do this so that I do not fail that test. The question is, will we? Do we really believe that the gospel is worth everything? Do we, do we really think it is? What, what are we willing to give up for the sake of the gospel? You know, after the rich young ruler left Jesus' presence, Jesus said, it is easier, right? You guys know this. It's easier for the rich man. I'm sorry, it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of the, of the needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven. And this shocked Peter. And Peter's like, what? And if, if he can't be saved, who can be? And Jesus said, with man it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And then, Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything to follow you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone, this includes us, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Jesus absolutely expected us to give up everything, if necessary, for the sake of his name, for the sake of the gospel. And Paul believed this. 
He believed that giving up everything for the sake of the gospel was of utmost importance. His entire argument through 1 Corinthians is to make this point. Don't argue about who saved you. You were saved by gospel workers. Don't try to look profound, powerful, and prestigious. Right? But give the gospel or out, right? Even if it's a stumbling block to the Jews and, and foolishness to the Gentiles, you're about the gospel. Get rid of the one who refuses to repent. Such things should not be mentioned among. Uh, such things are not even mentioned among the pagans, to whom you are supposed to give witness of the gospel. Don't take your brother to court where those whom you they, they, uh, uh, whom, whom you are supposed to evangelize are sitting and start accusing one another and giving a bad name to Christ. Your leading spouse leaves, let them go. You're free then. Free to share the gospel without restraints. If you're single, stay single. Why? Because there's a great mission out there that involves the gospel. It's all about the gospel. Every decision that we make ought to be about the gospel. How does this affect the gospel? So, is, is it for us? Is it not the gospel?